Okay, okay thanks you for, com for coming to my talk, Cryptanalysis versus Reality. <coughs> so let, let me start. Uh, cryptanalysis and Reality, maybe you all have an idea of what it is, but let me give some tentative definitions. So cryptanalysis is the study of methods for obtaining the meaning of encrypted information without access to the secret information that is normally required to do so. So typically that is the key. But actually this definition is a bit narrow, a bit restrictive, for an attacker can have much different goals than decrypting or recovering the, recovering the key, in particular when there is no key at all. That's why we have much better definition than this one. So one can say that the fundamental goal of cryptanalyst is to violate one or several security notions for algorithm that claim implicitly or explicitly to satisfy these notions. So that is really a much better definition. You can think, for example, of hash function. So the goal of an attacker can be to find a collision for hash function in the case you have no key. Another goal can be to forge a valid Mac for HMAC, for example. Another goal would be to impersonate a user in an authentication protocol. Okay. <coughs> now, if you go back to the reality, reality that's the state of, of things as they actually exist, not how you can idealize or, or dream them. Yet, as you know, reality is quite complex. When we make decisions in our lives, we have to simplify things. We cannot consider all the consequences of our actions. We cannot consider all the parameters. So implicitly, we simplify reality. And that's what cryptanalysts are doing. We simplify reality, we create models. We use models which are just mathematical objects that say what the attacker is allowed and not allowed to do, what we assume that the attacker can and can't do. So that's just a formal way of saying this. It's not something completely artificial. It's just what we need to do cryptanalysis. And it would be completely impossible to do serious cryptanalysis work without actually this model. So as you probably know, the models, they exclude the attack that target the user instead of the crypto. So this includes, for example, bribery, coercion, burglary, keylogging, social engineering. Although if you attended the previous talk, these techniques are quite effective, quite powerful. But that's not the point of cryptanalysis. The point of cryptanalysis is the crypto. Okay. It doesn't mean that crypto is disconnected from, rea from reality. It means that the point of crypto is, cryptanalysis is just crypto. Okay. So cryptanalysis used to be tightly connected to reality. What you see on the background is a machine called the bomb that was constructed by Alan Turing and his colleagues in 1939. And it was used to decrypt the communications of the Germans during World War II. I couldn't find a better example of cryptanalysis connected to reality. That was during World War II. Now, if you go back to uh, 2011, things have really changed. So I slightly edited this Dilbert strip, and at the end have uh, Wally who says, uh, I use partial matching to be the related keys or some distinguisher on the radius round compression function. I didn't really make this up. You can really find this kind of statement in state-of-the-art research papers. If you don't believe me, let me show you some examples of very recent research. So we have examples of semi-free start near collision attacks, multi-collision distinguishers, radiated key attacks, pseudo blah blah blah, boomerang distinguisher on 34 rounds. Oops. That's not connected? Looks better. Okay. <coughs> so we have things like boomerang distinguishers with this completely insane complexity. Known related key distinguishers. Known key. Isn't the key supposed to be secret? That doesn't make sense. So when people who are not into this kind of thing, they read this, they tend to translate it into uh, a yes encryption is cracked or cipher false, hackers crack internet encryption. Pretty scary titles. So here we we have a problem. So the problem is just that if when it's broken in a model, it's not necessarily broken in reality. Why do we have this situation? One of the reasons is that we use the same language. We use the same words. We use the words attack, broken. And in the world of models, 
broken doesn't mean broken in reality. So as cryptanalysts, as the academic people, maybe we should say to ourselves, maybe we lost connection with reality. Do our models make sense? Does it make sense to do cryptanalysis at all? Because if you look at people who do reward stuff like pen testing, they see that crypto is usually bypassed. And that's something that, what that said Adi Shamir, who is a crypto guy, and he recognized this. So uh, let you read those few lines. Okay. He finishes by saying, there are much simpler ways of penetrating the security system. You can forge a malicious PDF, send it to uh, an employee, and you're done. Okay. <coughs> so this gives the question, is crypto is this relevant at all? Does it make sense to spend time, energy, and money attempting to break ciphers where well nobody cares after all? That's a bit a provocative question. So that's what I would like to, to answer in this talk. I will start by briefly talking about physical attacks on the crypto, not on the people. Then the main part of the talk will be algorithmic attacks. I will make a brief state of the art on the security of ciphers that we all know. I will give you five reasons why the attacks that you hear about in the news or in literature are not necessarily attacks in the real world. Then I will talk about the human factor, the cognitive biases in play, before saying a few words about AES, cipher that we all know and we all use every day. Okay. <coughs> Physical attacks. So, you know, if you use your favorite internet browser, you go to an HTTPS website, you have this little log that means that you are perfectly secure. So this uses, for example, RSA cryptography with 2048 bits of modulus. So that's not the level of, sec of security. The level of security of this model size is approximately 100 bits. It means that if you were to attack RSA, it would take approximately 2 to the 100 operations to break RSA by factoring the modulus. So I don't enter the details by seeing what an operation is, but you get the idea. So this is infeasible with today's computer. Now the question, can we do better than this? As the first option is to use a quantum computer. It would take only 2 to the 33 operations using Schwarz algorithm. The good news, or bad news, is that we don't know how to build quantum computers. We don't even know if it's physically possible to construct quantum computers. So let's think about other alternatives. How can you attack HTTPS faster than a quantum computer? Well, you can just compromise certificate authority. And that's much more powerful, two to the zero operations. So what you see here is uh, an excerpt from a ROC certificate that was issued to Google by the Dutch, Dutch CA uh, DigiNotar. You probably all know the story. And it was not issued on the request of Google, but apparently hacker intruded the system of DigiNotar. And even though he didn't have the actual private key, he had the power to create certificates. And it was actually used by the Iranian government to spy on its citizens through man in the middle attacks. But if you see the certificate they use one, they use RSA encryption, relatively strong cryptography. But the point is that the it could as well have been SHA 512 or RSA with 16 billions of bits. This couldn't have changed anything because the crypto was completely bypassed. The attack didn't care about the crypto that was used. Another example of such bypass is what happened last year to the secure product, secure USB drive by Kingston SanDisk and Verbatim. So they were FIPS 142 certified. They use AES encryption with 256 bits of security. But to decrypt the data on the drive, you needed a password. And the problem is that they made a very stupid verification of the password. It was made in the, in the host PC. And when the password was correct, the PC was just sending a constant signal to the drive, OK, saying the password is valid. So it was very easy to break. No, um, no amazing complexity. Crypto completely bypassed. So sometimes the crypto is not bypassed, but it's exploited to attack the system. Yeah, it happens. And it's because it's 
maybe misused or misimplemented. So I'll give you three short examples that you've probably read about in the news. The first one is very funny, it's the case of Sony's PlayStation 3. So Sony has a problem with random numbers. So ECDAC is an um, elliptic curve-based digital signature algorithm. It's probably secure, it's, it's certified by uh, all the standards that you want, it's used by NIST, it's used by the NSA. But you need randomness. And if your randomness is not random, then the system completely breaks down. So because of this stupid implementation error, one can recover the key just e very easily by doing a multiplication and a division. You don't even know to you don't even need to know how ECDSA works. You don't know to you don't need to know about elliptic curves. So the core system was completely broken due to this implementation error. Another classical case is that of RC4 in web. So the Wi-Fi protection web, they use this relatively secure stream safer RC4, which is okay when the key is secret. The problem with web is that they make a part of the key secret and part of another part of the key that is public and predictable from one session to another. So if RC4 were um, ideal, perfectly perfect, this wouldn't cause any problem, but the problem is that you have some internal biases in the structure of RC4. And if you make part of the key public, then the biases can be exploited to recover the key. That's what happened to, to web. And the last example is a different scenario, is what happened with the, the Xbox. So Microsoft, they wanted to create a new, um, to, to make an update that would use a hash function based on a very light block cipher. So they went to Google, they typed tiny encryption algorithm. You can, you can try it. And what you will find, the first entry that shows up is T, a tiny encryption algorithm, which is a relatively decent cipher, as long as you use it uh, as a cipher, as long as the key is secret. If you use it to construct a hash function, it's completely different because the key, what is used as a key is not secret, is the message. And the problem is in T is that you have equivalent keys. So different keys, but that give the same uh, input-output relations for the cipher. And if you convert this into a hash function, this allows you to find collisions very efficiently. And that's, what, that's why the security failed in this case. Now what happens if you use a good crypto, you implement it well, you use it well, you use very random numbers, but you are in a hostile environment. So what does it mean to, to work in a hostile environment? It means possibility of side channel attacks. Side channel attacks first in software, it can be, for example, um, leaks on the, the time of execution. And the case of AES is uh, sometimes problematic because if you implement AES in software, you have to use big tables. And accesses to those tables take time that is dependent on, on the key. So in other words, you have timing leaks. The time of execution is dependent on your key. So by simple information theory, by making time measurements, you get information on your key. And last year, so you had this uh, actually secure implementation in OpenSSL 0.9.8. But some Swiss researchers, they, they found a way to attack it. The attack was very efficient in, uh, in a few seconds. And the interesting thing here is that you don't need to know the plain text. You don't even know to know the cipher text. You just need to make some pretty accurate timing measurements. And then you win. And it works also on uh, ARM9. So for information, OpenSSL has been patched. Even though it's not very well documented in OpenSSL, but I hope that the version 1.0 is, uh, is fixed. Another side channel that can be exploited is uh, how an error in the encoding is uh, is managed by the system. So this is the padding oracle tool. So the guy who the guys who made these padding oracle attacks, they exploit in part the timing of the time of execution, but they also exploit how the system responds to an error in the padding. So that can be seen as well as some such an information, and that was exploited in this padding oracle attack. But such an attacks they are much more famous when comes to, to hardware. 
it's much more powerful than software such an attack. So you can do power analysis, SPIDPA, electromagnetic analysis, glitching neck attacks, microprobing, and even more powerful laser laser injection attacks. So you can uh, uh, send laser impacts to to your system to modify the content of the registers of the memory, to modify the instructions that will be executed. For example, if you have AES 128, normally you would do 10 rounds of encryption. But if you send a photo on the counter so, th so that instead of making 10 rounds, you only make one round, then it's much easier to, to break. This kind of thing happens in, in reality. Uh, focus ion beam is, is even more powerful. You can directly modify the circuit, modify the behavior of your circuit. But if you look at all those attacks, they, they target the crypto, they don't target the user, but more precisely, they target the implementation, not the, not the algorithm. So if you want to evaluate the actual, the intrinsic security of your cipher, you have to view it as an algorithm, independently of the implementation. And as that's what algorithmic attacks are about. So let me define it in a quite informal way. So an algorithmic attack is an attack that targets the function, the crypto, as an algorithm. And the attack itself is described as an algorithm. And they are completely independent of the implementation. Don't care whether it's hardware or software, you look at a sequence of instruction, at an algorithm. OK. <coughs> so I'm. Um, we're going to focus on uh, symmetric functions like block ciphers, stream ciphers, hash functions, so the random number generators, and message authentication codes. There would be very interesting things to say about public encryption or signatures, about authentication protocol, but I don't have that much time. Okay. So if you consider the ciphers, so these last years there has been some, some news about AES. You probably heard that AES was broken. It's not that broken. The same for Ghost. If you follow the crypto groups on LinkedIn or if you look at the news in UK newspapers, may you may have read that Ghost is broken. That's wrong. Same for the 3GPP encryption, Kazumi. It's completely safe. Triple Desk is safe as long as you don't need more than 112 bits of security. If you read Bruce Nyer's blog, you might have read that SHA-1 is broken. It's not. A you can also read that Whirlpool is broken, but it's not broken in reality. So it's safe to use all, all those functions. Yet there are some cases where the crypto is a bit more broken. That's the case of this. So this is broken not due to crypto analytic attacks, but it's broken just due to his, its small key size, 56 bits. If you use a cluster of PGAs, in two or three days you can find a key. A51, GSM encryption. There are some problems with the ciphers that facilitates uh, actual attacks. And apparently, there has been some proof of concept realized, and the attack seems to work. And last but not least, the case of MD5. So don't use MD5. Actually, in practice, it's safe if you just need pre-image resistance, if you don't care about collisions. But it's prudent to avoid MD5 completely now. You, we have much better functions. So you might wonder, do we have ciphers that are not broken, even in theory? Well, of course, we have plenty of them. The default cipher in OpenPGP CAS5 is not very well known, but it's very secure. ID it was designed uh, by uh, researchers not very far from Lucerne in, in Zurich in 1991, and it's still secure. It's one of the ciphers that resisted the best. ID next, it's a new generation of ID. The two EAS finalists, Serpron and Tufish, or Serpron by Elie Biham or Sanderson, and some colleagues, and two fish by uh, Bruchnayer and uh, other people. When it comes to stream ciphers, so stream ciphers are generally lighter to implement. Grain 128A for hardware is very good. It fits in fewer than 3,000 gates. Salsa 20 by Dan Bernstein. You can find it in the library Knuckle. Very good, too. And if you, uh, if you want to choose a... Sorry? So 
I won't answer now. I hope that the rest of the talk will uh, answer. Thanks. So, yeah, what's the hash function? So, it's safe to use SHA2. It's safe to use RapeMD if you use a uh, TrueCrypt. I think the default function and uh, the default hash function is TrueCrypt is uh, RapeMD. And the default cipher is uh, AES. And you can also use a uh, user prompt. Okay. So now you might wonder. Why, we, why do we care? Uh, there are many people doing cryptanalysis. There are armies of PhDs in universities publishing papers and papers and papers about how not to break ciphers. Yet we never see real breaks. We hear about uh, non-breaks in the news, but real breaks seldom happen. So why? Why is it this? So the first reason is that many attacks um, published like the attack on AES have a very high complexity, very large number of operations. Last year there was an attack by um, Japanese researchers from NTT on MD5. It was a pre-image attack, so which means it was an attempt to invert the function. That's supposed to be one way. It had complexity 2 to the 123.4 operations, whereas ideally would it, you would expect 2 to the 128. So this is called an attack just because 123 is a smaller num number than 128, not because it has anything to do with security. So apparently this attack don't matter as long as the effort is infeasible or if the effort is much larger than that of other attacks. Maybe the most uh, important impact on the security is you can no longer claim that MD5 has 128 bit of security. If uh, you are a company, you sell crypto, it's not mathematically correct to say that it has 120 bit of security. But in practice, it doesn't change anything. So it's a bit of a philosophical problem. So let me give you this uh, quote by a colleague, John Kelsey, from the US NIST. He says that uh, the difference between 80 and 108 bit security it's like the difference between a mission to Mars and a mission to Alpha Centauri. So one very difficult and one almost impossible. And continue saying that I uh, think there is no meaningful difference between 192 bit and 256 bits of keys in terms of brute force. Impossible is impossible. So uh, in other words, we don't care about the difference between the numbers as long as it's impossible. If you go back to reality for a minute, let's look at what state-of-the-art CPUs can do. That's a Core i7 uh, at 2 gigahertz. It makes 2 to the 33 clocks per second, which means 2 to the 58 in one year, 2 to the 68 in 1,000 years, and 2 to the 116 in a bit more than 13 billions of years. So if you compare those numbers to the 123 we saw before, well, you conclude that even two to the 100 is very secure. So there are some subtleties. Sometimes you can paralyze the attack. You you can increase, you can decrease your chance of success. But still, we deal with huge, n huge numbers. Another quote by um, security researchers: They say that the encryption doesn't have to be very strong. It just must be stronger than the other weak links. That's plain common sense. But if you look at the cryptographic li literature, many people don't have this uh, common sense reasoning. Cryptographers focus on crypto, and they tend to forget that there is something outside crypto. Okay. Now, let me give you an overview of the second reason why attacks are not always attacks in the real world, is that people publish results on building blocks of the functions, not on the full function. For example, there was this collision attack on a SHA-3 candidate called Lane. So SHA-3 will be the new hash function standard of the US government next year. So it had complexity slightly below the ideal complexity, 96 instead of 128. It did not lead to an attack on the hash function. It was just invalidating a security proof. It was not invalidating the result, but just the proof. Yet the US uh, standard uh, institution they deemed the attack was dangerous enough to eliminate lane from the competition. 
quite surprising. So you might wonder why did they do this? Two, there are two interpretations to attacks on building blocks and components of a cryptographic function. The first one is to say, well, okay, it's better to have an attack on a building block than no attack at all. Maybe it's a sign that there would, would be something bigger. Maybe it's just the beginning. If you read Bruce Nair, you know the quote, attacks never get worse, always get better. So you should conclude, let's be prudent and don't use this. On the other hand, you might think that, okay, these guys, they publish this result on a subcomponent of the function. So it means that they have tried really hard to break the system, to break the whole function. And what they could only come up with is this non result on a, on a building block. So this can be seen as an evidence that people have tried to break it but failed. It's an evidence that there was some analysis on it. And in general, it's suspicious if there is no result at all on a, on a crypto function. If there is no crypto analysis published on reduced version, you don't know if people have looked at it seriously. Now, if we move to the third reason, very interesting one, is that crypto analysis, we have very strong models, very strong security models. We assume that the adversary is very powerful. We assume that he can make chosen plain text queries, chosen cipher text queries. And recently, we also assume that they can make related key attacks. So what is a related key attack is where you assume that you have access to an oracle that gives you the encryption or the hash or whatever, where the key is a modified version of the original key. But not any modification. You choose the modification of the key. You choose the function f that defines the key k prime, which is a function of the original key k. Quite surprisingly, when Turing and his colleagues in 1940, when they broke Enigma, they implicitly used rated keys because the operators were doing mistakes using the wrong key. And then they resend the message again with the correct key. Yet the modern version was only introduced in 1992. So if you use any state-of-the-art protocol, any series protocol, it's completely infeasible. It's completely heuristic. There are some cases of protocols like EMV or 3 GPP where it seems doable, but the model is very special too. I want to give you a concre more concrete example of what a rated key attack can be. So there was an attack by uh, Russian researchers two years ago on AES-256. Complexity 2 to the 119 instead of 2 to the 256. They use four related keys. And if you look at the paper, at the research paper in details, they not only use related keys, they use related sub-keys. So let me try to summarize. They, they assume that the attacker can ask for an encryption with a key that is such that the sub-key of the third round has a very specific modification compared to the original sub-key. Well, that's even more insane, <laughs> yes. Round keys, yeah. yeah. Round keys. And actually, they admit that the attacks are mainly of theoretical interest at best and do not present a threat to practical applications. I hope you'll all agree with that. Okay. <laughs> now let's look at what happens in reality. So in the field where, I where I'm working in native encryption, we have very different models. So we encrypt the MPEG stream, that is, uh, send us uh, TS and transport stream packets with a cipher called CSA, Common Scrambling Algorithm. You know, in PTV, we don't encrypt, we scramble. So the key of uh, CSA has 48 or 64 bits. That looks quite small. But if you look at the use case, how it's used, then you can't modify the key. You don't know the key. You only know ciphertext. You know some part of the header of the packets, but you don't know a complete block. So you cannot make known play text attacks, just partially known play text. You cannot make time memory trade-offs, rainbow tables, this kind of thing. And last but not least, you have only 10 seconds to break the cipher. Why? Because the key is refreshed every 10 seconds, and the new key is completely independent of the previous one. That's a model you find a real one, maybe a very extreme one, but uh, still, 
that's what uh, hackers have to have to fight. But you know, if you don't practice people, they, they don't care of these pirates. They don't break the crypto. They just share the control word. They just share the key, and that's it. So they bypass crypto again. So another, the next reason is that there is not only time. There is also space. There is also memory. If you look in details at those, uh, at those attacks, at the attacks on MD5, on Lane, at on AES256, so they use a huge amount of operations. They also use a huge amount of memory. More than 1,024 TB bytes, insane uh, quantities of memory. You know. But that's not free. You need, you need to pay for this. You need infrastructure. The latency to access a random element in a huge memory is not, not that small. And the problem when you look at the analysis in those papers, they make the completely insane assumption that it takes the same time to access an element in this kind of memory as to make an XOR between two worlds. Yeah. And so if you are in the real world, you should compare these attacks with generic attacks with the same budget, with the same money, with the same hardware. And then the comparison is much different. So if you have a um, lot of money, you will not do a stupid brute force using a single computer. You will build a cluster of machines. You will build a, build a cluster of ASICs or FPGAs. And this is much more powerful than a stupid brute force. You should look at uh, Dan, Dan Bernstein's paper uh, on, this, on this topic. It's called Understanding Brute Force. Okay. <coughs> and the last, uh, the most crazy reason is that now we are breaking ciphers not by recovering the key, but by distinguishing them. So what does it mean, distinguishing attacks? So it used to be um, before the finding of a statistical bias. For example, in my hash function, the first bit is more from 0 than 1, or the byte uh, FF is a bit more frequent than the other bytes. Now we call an attack anything that that is something, anything that shows a an unexpected behavior of the function. Sometimes when you look at we look at AES, we devise attacks where we assume that the key is known, and sometimes that the key is chosen. There are attacks that are called known key attacks. There are attacks called chosen key attacks. The goal of those attacks is just to find a relation between the input and the output that is not expected. And it's very hard to define what this means. Yuan Demen, one, uh, one of the inventors of AES, he called those attacks, uh, you know what I mean, attacks, because we don't know how to define them. And this is an example of attack on AES that appeared two years ago. So they found keys, K1, K2, K3, and so on, and plain text P1, uh, P2, and relations, delta and lambda, that satisfy this relation. I'll, uh, I'll leave you... Uh, 10 seconds to try to understand it. It's called Q multi collisions. Well, it's quite meaningless. But they got a paper published uh, because of that. Okay, no impact on security. The biggest impact is on the resume of the researchers. <coughs> okay. <laughs> yes? Uh, will not comment this. <laughs> so, yes. On the one hand, it's not um, useful, it's not meaningful in terms of uh, real security. On the other hand, the attacks are very sophisticated, sometimes very clever. In terms of mathematical techniques, um, they use quite advanced algorithms. To attack AES, they use graph theory. So it's interesting for mathematicians sometimes. The best argument I can find. <laughs> so we have seen that there are these five reasons why uh, attacks are not always attacks. And we have two general interpretations. So the pessimistic one is that, oh, it's a bad sign and there must be something bigger. The crypto is not ideal. It may be weak and may be broken in 10 years. And the optimistic approach is that, well, people have looked at it during three years. 
and they could only find a distinguishing attack with the insane uh, memory requirement, so it's safe. So people have very different interpretations. People are very strongly biased. So I tried to find reasons why we, we have these biases, and the, the first I could find um, in favor of the um, first interpretation is the what we call numerology, cryptographic numerology. So I didn't make this up. It's a um, notion introduced by other researchers. And the idea is that uh, you would define the security of the system in just in terms of key size. They said the concept is as long as your encryption keys are that big, then you're fine. Because you can put a sticker on your product, say, uh, 2,000 bit security, and then uh, you don't have to worry about the rest of the system. And why we do this? We do this because choosing a key size is very easy. Just use a random generator, you take a key of 5 to 12 bits, and now you have much better security. If you Google the internet for snake oil security products, you will find things like uh, virtual encryption uh, with 3,000 bits of security. It's just marketing, it's just advertisement. And in this case, it's a specific case of zero risk bias. A zero risk bias is the tendency to reduce a small risk to a completely zero risk. So you will pay a lot of money, of energy, of power to reduce this negligible risk, whereas it could be economically much more interesting to reduce another risk, say, from 50 or 30 percent. In the case of crypto, it translates into reducing the risk of the scary new attack. Uh, maybe to tomorrow someone will break a yes, so Let's over encrypt with AES, yes, with Serpent, with two fish. Uh, I found this in the real world in a cloud storage system. Maybe uh, you heard people completely panicked at the idea of using RSA with only 1,024 bits. They say, yeah, well you shouldn't move to 2048 or 4096 RSA, uh, otherwise the system will be broken. Problem is that this we ha always have the law of unintended conse consequences. If you use stronger crypto, if you use a uh, bigger RSA moduli, then you get slower crypto. And then it's too slow sometimes, it's not deployed, and at the end of the day, you get less security. So that's why, that's what, how many people think about crypto. That's why they are so scared when they hear about attacks on AES. Now the, the next bias is the bias uh, towards the optimistic approach. They say, well, ciphers are never broken. But why are they never broken? Because we never hear about broken ciphers. We only remember the unbroken ciphers that are deployed in security products or in standards. We never hear about uh, ciphers that are broken by unknown researchers and published in uh, conferences in a small town in India with 25 attendees. We never hear about those attacks. If I give you a very good example of this, there is a Shastri competition for the new hash function. They received 64 submissions, and 56 of them were published in 2008. So we tried to break them, and we could break 14 with actual attacks that work, that could be implemented, and that could be verified. We did find actual cohesions. We did find actual pre-images. These are real-world attacks. Three close to practical attacks in complexity approximately to do the 60, what you can do in a, in a few months with a good hardware, and 14 very high complexity attacks. This looks much more balanced. And those 14 plus three ciphers that were broken with practical attacks, we will never hear about them again because they are considered as broken, and nobody will ever use them. And that's why practical attacks, very powerful attacks, they kill ciphers, before they are used. The ciphers that are deployed, they have always been analyzed for years and years by competent people. That's why there seems to be uh, no insecure cipher, but there are many insecure ciphers. Now, uh, yes. <coughs> so I'm sorry to inform you that AES is broken by a groundbreaking attack. Oh, it's the, they registered all this. Uh, it's, uh, the groundbreaking attack, the scary new attack that everybody expects, uh, yeah, it's broken. 
fortunately, the, if you look at the facts and not at uh, how you dream, the reality is much uh, more reassuring. These attacks, they are just four times faster than brute force. Four times. And on top of that, they require a lot of memory, a lot of data. The f attack on AES-128, it needs two to the 88 plain text ciphertext pairs. You need to collect this number of input outputs of AES. Whereas if you do the straightforward brute force, you need only one, so two to the zero plain text ciphertext pair. And it's very likely that if you implement this attack in, uh, say, in alien technology with ultra-powerful computers, quantum computers, it's very likely that the generic brute force will complete before these attacks. And I've heard very interesting reactions by customers and, uh, and colleagues. So we have one of our customers, the crypto expert of uh, another company. He said, yeah, I've read the paper. They say that AES is insecure. So in the new product that you deliver, we want to have AES with uh, 42 or I don't know how many rounds and uh, more stronger as boxes. So I tried to explain to him what was the, uh, the result, what was the impact of the attacks. But he was persuaded that AES was insecure, that AES would be broken in 10 years. On the other hand, we have other people that are completely blinded by uh, the three letters of AES. Say, oh, it's nothing. AES is safe. We can implement it however we want. It will always be safe. And because of this, they ignore such an attacks. They ignore cache timing attacks. They ignore by the bad implementations. So these are the pessimistic and the optimistic interpretation of uh, this kind of attack. So now let me briefly conclude what I said in this talk. So the algorithmic attacks on deploy scheme they have nothing to do with security. They're just theoretical results due to high complexity, strong models, uh, attacks and building blocks, extinguishers. Because the weak ciphers, we don't see them. We don't use them. They are broken before. They are killed before. Okay. And one of my colleagues, Ordun Kalman, he says, it's very correct. We don't break ciphers. We evaluate the, sec the security. If we, you look at the attacks on the ES, so now it may be fair to say that it has security of 126 bits. But it's just theory. Impossible is impossible. Okay. And we should look at the facts. Not we should be careful of this zero risk bias and survivorship bias. We should look at the actual complexity of the attacks, what the real experts say. We should be careful when you, we read the, the media when they say there is a groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking attack or a scary attack. And funny, yeah, AES is fine, but weak implementations are the biggest threat, uh, especially in software. Especially in software, okay. So I'd like to recommend you three uh, related readings. Maybe you heard about the leakage resilient cryptography. It's a theoretical subfield of crypto where people investigate schemes that resist to a partial leakage of the state or of the computation. They may, for example, assume that uh, half of your RSA key uh, is published, and they will try to devise a system that is resilient to this kind of leaks. And some people try to compare those models with real with reality. The second one is a, um, about brute force, how to use uh, the cloud infrastructure to brute force systems, to br how to break AES RSA using Amazon S3 Cloud. And the last one by uh, Pascal Geno is very interesting too. Investigates the security of libraries like Crypto Plus, Crypto Plus, OpenSSL, CryptoLib, Knuckle, against such an attacks, leakage attacks, uh, fault attacks. And his conclusion is that all these libraries, all these open source libraries are very weak. I'd like to thank you for your attention and if you have any questions. Thank you. So what is your opinion or how do you, is there any model or anything to judge a well-researched 
cipher that has some deficiencies versus less research ciphers that have come out clean yeah. is that pers like personal judgment yeah. or is there any sort of reasonable way to g decide no. such so you are there are a few heuristics to to judge of a uh, of the quality of a cipher first um, it's quite subjective by but you should look at who designed the ciphers uh, how it was published uh, is it a um, known researchers who published it in a well-known conf conference? You should search for attacks on deciphers in the literature, and then it's all not it's not always easy to interpret these attacks because people researchers they want to become famous. So if you read the abstract, people tend to overestimate the impact of the result. They will say uh, it's a big result. Say it's a big attack. Cipher is broken. So you should be very careful. You should you'd better look at the numbers than at the at the claims by the cryptanalysts. Right. But any discovery about um, a cipher that reduces its effectiveness uh, ma does have the chance to be used as a, a jumping board for another attack. So um, is there? I mean, so. Let me tell you the story of SHA-1. So SHA-1 was a replacement of SHA-0. There was an attack published by um, Chinese researchers with complexity uh, 2 to the 68, if I'm not mistaken. A few weeks later, there was an attack in 2 to the 65. A few weeks later, they found out that the 65 attack doesn't work. The year after, they found an attack in 2 to the 62 or 61, and last year or two years ago, Australian people found an attack in 2 to the 52. And all those attacks, they were refinements, refinements of the new attack. But some people tried to verify the attacks, tried to implement them, and they found a flaw in the attack. They found some issues with the probability. The 52 attack doesn't work, the 61 doesn't, doesn't work, and they're not sure that the, that the 68 attack works. So all those refinements, they were very incremental. It's not like if you go from 68 to 32, it's just very few. Uh, so this happens, but it's very likely that uh, you will have a um, huge breakthrough uh, from uh, impractical to practical. Yes? I've seen a lot of research where things like you have just been telling us uh, actually uh, was happening. How how is one able to actually like count like sort out the black sheep in the in the paper distribution mafia out there <laughs> to um, to validate the findings? It's like for even people that have been educated in writing crypto algorithms and like implementing them safely and stuff like that. For them, it's even hard to get some of the papers uh, in any kind of coding language coded into real stuff, right? So um, for all the math experts out there, it's going to be even harder sometimes. And um, how, do you, how, how would you say uh, you can get those black sheep to not disturb you? in your time. So here it's basically it's like a waste of time to implement something which is from somebody that has been uh, deploying papers that were complete nonsense in the past, right? So you talk about implementing an attack or implementing in a, a cipher? Uh, an attack. An attack. Um, the problem is um, the difficulty of implementation and of verification. The latest attacks on the ES the authors, they, imp they try to implement the attack. They implement all they could implement. They verified all they could verify. But there is a limit to this. You cannot complete the attack because the complexity is too high. You cannot make sure that, that, it, that it will work. So they, they made some partial verification. They verified that some properties were OK. But you can never have a, an evidence that the attack works until you you implement the complete attack. And 
There are some cases, uh, the case of MD5. So in this case, they could implement it. They could get the collision because the attack was practical. But if you want to verify by yourself the attack, um, it's not only about ciphers, right? It's yeah, like yeah. you have protocols where there are errors in, and there have been papers published about that. Mm. And sometimes it's just hard to grasp yeah. what was like, okay, there is like this a problem three, with four, that five is that pages out of the documentation missing yeah. that you would need for anything to validate yeah. what's out there. And if, if, if you make the effort to implement, to verify the results, the problem is that you won't get a paper published or you may post it in a forum, but they never publish papers where people are pointing out mistakes in previous papers. We never do that. People are too busy uh, increasing their resume. They don't spend the time to verify the proof. They don't spend the, the time to implement the attacks. So y if anyone is uh, willing to do this, it could be very good. But it's a big problem we have in the community. We have plenty of results, plenty of papers, but no one bothers verifying the results. About that, uh, I'd like to add to the SHA-1 uh, conclusion there. Yeah. Um, recently, um, Tavis or Mandy published uh, a 90-bit near collision uh, for SHA-1. I'd just like to add that. It was under full... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Full rounds. But it, it, it wasn't on an academic yeah, crypto yeah. conference. Yeah. So yeah. But I no, there, w there was a proof of concept in a reduced version of SHA-1 I don't know the details of Davis' uh, attack, but I should look at it. Okay. Another question? Okay, thank you. <laughs>